Hello, and welcome. <laughs> um, my name's John, I'm your Student Athlete Advisory Committee President. Um, today we have a very exciting talk for you. We have Derek Fieler of uh, Slippery Rock University graduate 2014. So um, yeah, uh, I'm pretty much gonna give the mic to him. If you guys have any questions, please just wait um, till the end. Um, please just wait till the end um, and we will pass the mic around. Um, if you can, please think of questions during the presentation or during his show, I guess you could say, um, and we will get those answered. So thank you very much. Without further ado, this is Derek Fiedler. How's it going, Lockhaven? Thanks for having me. Who's ready to talk about mental health? Yeah, our favorite subject, right? We all love talking about it. Not really, but um, this is a really important uh, subject for people your age especially. Your age is the most prone to developing mental illnesses, especially the two most uh, uh, reoccurring ones, depression and anxiety disorder. Now, everyone in here has not been through anxiety or depression, but someday you might go through it yourself. You might have a loved one that goes through it. And if you don't get through it at all, this talk is still for you. I'm teaching emotional intelligence. And every human, no matter how successful you become, some way, shape, or form, you're going to be dealing. Emotional intelligence teaches us how to get through those really stressful, tough times without letting it, getting emotionally hijacked and making decisions that we normally wouldn't want to make in the moment, right? So I'm going to be talking about using the word anxiety, depression, and at any moment you can replace this word with fear or stress, all right? Now, I'm not a professional. I didn't go to school. I'm not a doctor, and I'm not giving a lecture. I'm a storyteller. That's what I do is I tell stories. I tell my truth. And the really interesting thing about mental health is that it's not like the flu where the nurse can come in and say, you know, take your vitamins, take your flu shot, wash your hands, right? The really fascinating thing about mental health is that everyone has their own truth to what's going to get them to the other side, which is what's going to help them. So I'm here to tell my story. I'm here to tell my truth. And hopefully through me telling my truth, you all can find your truth, okay? Now, imagine that I've put you on a track told you to run consecutive continuous laps around that track and you're not allowed to stop. What's going to start happening to your body physically? For example, your heart rate's going to start increasing. Can anyone else give me another example? On the bus on the way to a game or waking you up in the middle of the night while you're sleeping. This is quite literally what has been happening to me since I was a kid. Since I was a child, I was diagnosed with anxiety and panic disorder. Wherever I was, I could be clenching my chest, gasping for air, covered in sweat. It was completely embarrassing. I had to leave the situation. And I, the only way I can describe it is as a heart attack, the stomach, all while in your brain, you're convinced that a grizzly bear is chasing you, getting ready to eat you. Panic attacks can become so intense that if a person doesn't know what's going on, they may believe that they're having a heart attack or a stroke and wipe in the hospital. Only for the doctor to find nothing wrong with them. This sounds terrifying, right? Where does this come from? Why does this happen? It all comes down to this little guy in your brain called the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of your brain that detects danger and preps for emergency events. Now, when the amygdala detects danger, it sends a message to the rest of your body to release adrenaline into the bloodstream. That's why, just like during a workout, your heart rate starts to increase and, uh, and to pump more blood in your body. You start breathing heavier to intake more oxygen for more increased focus, and a rush of energy is sent through your entire body. This is what we call fight or flight mode. This is an incredible feature in our bodies that has helped us survive as a species for thousands of years. But it does have its flaws. The amygdala cannot distinguish between true life danger and things that we simply fear like performing during a sports event, taking a test, or asking someone out on a date. Basically, an anxiety attack 
is the misfire of the fight or flight sensation when there's no true danger at all. Is this permanent? Are people that have overactive amygdalas, are they broken and that's just, there's just nothing they can do about it? Absolutely not. Your brain, and especially your amygdala, is just like a muscle. With practice and effort every single day, we can learn to train our amygdala to calm down and to actually enjoy these things that we fear and teach them that these aren't things that are dangerous. Although depression and anxiety is an overreaction to certain events and situations in our lives, there is a really uh, useful, there's a useful, uh, there's a lot of useful things we can learn from the journey of getting to the other side. When we see it this way, when we understand depression and anxiety, we no longer have to see ourselves as a broken piece of machinery, but rather we can view our mental illness as a moral compass pointing towards a more resilient, stronger, and happier life. Let me explain. In high school, I got mediocre grades, was a professional bench warmer on the basketball team, and tried to be a part of a group of people who convinced me in the form of harsh nicknames and rumors that being good for nothing was exactly who I was. I let myself be these people's punching bag, and eventually I began to believe that everything they said about me was the truth. They weren't the only ones putting me down, though. Like I said before, I was diagnosed with anxiety and panic disorder. This perfect storm of internal and external circumstances absolutely robbed me of my confidence as a high schooler. So I just completely gave up. I just went through the motions. What was the point in trying when you're just born a certain way and there's nothing that you can do about it? You're either born with confidence or you're born insecure. You're either born smart, average, or dumb, or you're born with an anxious, pessimistic person like me where you had a really great outlook on life and there was nothing you could do about it. I was just given, draw I was just given a bad card. That is, until I discovered something that would teach me that all that was a lie and I could work on every single one of those things every day if I really wanted to. It was freshman year of high school and it was track season. I decided for some reason I was going to try the high jump. I have no idea why. I'm not tall. I wasn't athletic at the time. I think I just really hated running, and it had the least amount of running of any event. So I gave it a shot. And high jump went kind of how everything else was going for me in high school. One of my first practices, I jumped over the bar. You land on your shoulders, and my knee came right into my face, breaking my nose, ending up at the ER, bleeding all over the place. I came back because I was really stubborn. I just wanted to prove to myself I could get over the bar without kneeing myself in the face, right? Didn't get the districts that year, but that didn't matter. Sports was always my outlet. It was my healthy outlet. Whenever I got bullied or picked on or had an anxiety attack that made me miss out on something, I went to the gym. I went for a run to train even harder until those feelings went away altogether. I ended up coming back by my junior year to win districts, break my high school record, and placed there in the state of Pennsylvania in the high jump. Colleges started sending me letters. Me, the kid who was told by his advisors that he probably shouldn't even consider going to college. I was never the same again. And I never looked at myself the same way again. Mind you, this entire time, no matter how good I got at track, the people that were giving me a hard time didn't accept me more. And my anxiety attacks didn't slow down much at all. The only thing that changed was I made the choice, the decision, to take that raw energy and put it into my gas tank instead of letting myself on fire with it. So we know that the amygdala is what triggers that anxiety disorder, right? But there are three key things uh, externally that might cause someone to have an anxiety disorder or uh, clinical depression. They categorize into biological, psychological, and sociological events. Biological, genetic, genetics, chemical processes. If you're where I'm from in Erie, Pennsylvania, there's not much sun. You're not getting very, very much vitamin D. That's a chemical process. Drugs, alcohol, your diet, how much sleep you get. Those are all factors. Now, when I talk to students back at Penn State Barron where I work, 
and I ask them what is the number one, or what causes depression and anxiety, the number one answer I always get is a chemical imbalance in the brain. It's a very small piece of a very large puzzle. It's not that simple. Psychological, mood, personality, behavior. I told you when I was in high school, I was convinced that angry people were just born angry people, and people that had a really good outlook on life were just born that way too. It's not, it's not so simple. Through emotional intelligence, through therapy, and um, paying attention to our habits ourselves, we can learn to uh, change these things, especially also through meditation, which I'll get to later. Sociological, culture, family, economics. Did your family struggle financially? Were your parents healthy people? Do you have a re healthy relationship with your friends, with your significant other? Is what you're going to school for something that you love? Do you feel like you have a purpose in life? Do you have a feeling like you have a purpose in life with your job? All these things factor into your mental health. So it's not like your brain, your brain isn't broken. It's not like there's something wrong with it. It's an imbalance. Your depression, your anxiety is an alarm, a signal that's going off telling you you need to adjust one of these things in your life. If you don't enjoy your job, you need to find something else more meaningful. If you're not getting enough sleep, if you're not eating healthy, or you need to acknowledge and accept that maybe you have an anger problem or that you get like this or like that and you make impulsive decisions. Then there's the other side of it, like family that you can't change, that you need to learn to accept them for who they are and not try to change them. Accepting is extremely powerful. I don't dwell on this slide terribly much because you don't get to ask life why. Life asks you why and you have to answer. Like me, I had a great life growing up. Nothing traumatic necessarily happened to me as far as no one died, no one got cancer. I felt so guilty about my depression and anxiety growing up because I was like, I don't understand. I grew up in the United States. I have a roof over my head, food on the table. So many people have it worse than me, but I still feel this way. I just want you to know that the things that you're feeling and going through are completely natural and are there for a reason. The first step in getting better is acknowledging and accepting your anxieties and your fears. I had to use my emotional intelligence. I had to pay extremely close attention to what was going on and when and see if there was a pattern between my anxiety and things that were going on externally. I learned that it was long and far cards from home. I had a terrible phobia of always becoming sick, especially from eating out places and food poisonings and any type of social situation to do with peers my age, such as sleepovers when I was younger or field trips or just going to school in general. Once I acknowledged and accepted these things, I had a choice. It was a choice that I could make or not make every single day of my life. I could stay at home, and I could avoid all these situations, and I'd be safe and comfortable, and I probably wouldn't have much anxiety, right? But it would be at the cost of living the life that I really wanted to live. Or I could continue to do everything I would do normally, despite the chance of an anxiety attack, or even if one happened. What I'd come to find was that the more I purposely put myself in these situations, the less severe and painful they became over time. Not right away, but over time. I had to teach my amygdala that long and far cards from home weren't dangerous, that eating out wasn't something that was always going to make me sick, right? And that I could enjoy being with my friends and family. It, but it took time. I had to seek out my anxiety before it found me. I used it as my fuel to move forward, as a motivation to better myself. I realized the only way to get over the anxiety was to go through that awful feeling, not around it and not to avoid it. In college, I was on the track team. And we would travel two or three hours for meets. And I had to have a bag of things in my lap, Advil, Pepto-Bismol water bottle, my hoodie over my face, my headphones in my ears, just in case I had an anxiety attack. But that just became the norm by college. I loved college. Things had gotten so much better than high school. I was getting great grades, teammates I could call family. And by junior year, I had won conference championships in the heptathlon. There are high expectations for me to go to nationals my senior year and break the school record. I was 16th in the nation. They take the top 12 in nationals. Unfortunately, 
None of that happened. Going into my senior year, when I was just 21 years old, when I was in the peak of my athletic career, I was blindsided by depression. At first, it sank into my skin. And doing things like hanging out with friends just seemed pointless. Maybe I just realized that I don't relate to them anymore. But then I reached my bones. And I couldn't get out of bed, couldn't shower. Hell, I couldn't even reach for a glass of water. Until finally, I reached my heart. And every moral and passion I ever had, just suddenly, out of nowhere, felt vacant. This, this is when the unthinkable happens. When the track star can't make it to practice. When the most motivated kid in the classroom starts skipping classes. When I finally had to quit the track team. When I thought I was going to have to drop out of college when I was just two semesters from graduating. When, like so many other college students, I drank my pain away. When the consequences to my health and my well-being just didn't matter anymore. I was scared to lose my life. I remember sitting outside of class, way to take an exam. This time I had to check myself into a hospital. A piece of my brain was stolen from me. I was sure of it. But with the incredible support of my family, friends, teammates, and therapists and coaches, I survived. I survived and I didn't end up like the other 800,000 people who take their own lives in depression every single year. I still graduate on time, but I lost my last year of track. Something that I can never get back. The one thing that I did do right is that I told people that what was going on I talked about it. Not everybody is going to understand. I'm not going to stand here and try to lie to you. A lot of people aren't going to understand. But the people that do understand, they will be enough. I promise you. The worst thing you can do is hide it. Especially from your coaches, especially from your teammates, especially from your professors. If you start skipping classes and you're, and you're not telling your professor what's going on, they're going to assume you're being lazy or you're not, you don't care, right? But if you tell them what's going on, they will work with you. I promise. And for anyone out there that gets approached by someone going through this and you don't know how to talk to them, and you don't understand what's going on, that's fine. You're not supposed to understand what's going on. You cannot understand what's going on unless you've been through it yourself. But you have to, what you have to do is take them seriously and not try to convince them that what they're going through isn't real. They need compassionate listening. They don't need some answer that's going to pop them out of, or, you know, get them out of uh, their funk, right? Be there to help them ride out the storm. So I graduate college. My last year was flipped upside down. And I did not end it the way I wanted to or even planned. And suddenly, I had this realization whether it was depression or graduation, you're tired, right? You feel nauseous. You start, my, my athletic career was going to be over eventually, whether I got to nationals or not. Every student athlete has to draw a line in the sand when they're no longer a student athlete and they have to move on with their lives. We aren't like musicians or artists or photographers in the way that we can do what we're best at what gives us routine and purpose and passion 
our entire lives. We have to recreate ourselves. We have to find new passions. We have to take everything we learned from what we did in college in our sport and apply it to new things. And I had to do that, not just for my, my, uh, for myself and in, in ex, in, in externally, but for my mental health as well. So after college, I bought a national park pass, I packed my car, and I drove around the country, and I traveled to every national park in the country. I took a year off. Depression gave me this urge that I had to live life to the fullest now, that I didn't have time because anything could happen at any moment. I wrote every single thing down that happened to me, and I uh, applied it to my mental health and what I learned from it. This was my truth. This was my new passion, right? I then took what I learned from traveling in my depression, all that stuff I did, all that dedication and hard work that I put from athletics, and I put it into becoming a speaker. And I gave my first TED Talk in 2017. From there, I was in invited to Harrisburg for the Governor's State Dinner from Governor Tom Wolf to be recognized for my mental health advocacy. And now I created the Paradigm Journals where I go to schools like this and I give my talks all over the place, high schools, colleges, middle schools, in Pennsylvania and outside of Pennsylvania. Today, I have found peace and acceptance when it comes to my battle with mental illness. Mental illness has taught me to appreciate and not take for granted right now. I had been comfortable with life. If anxiety and depression, nothing, nothing I wouldn't have today. It's on the other side of what we're dealing with. It directly affects your mood. I've been seeing a therapist since I was in the fourth grade, and she's one of the single most important people to ever come into my life. Therapists are unique in the way that they are professionals that have no emotional investment in what you're going through and will be able to give the most logical and practical advice. I don't care how close you are with your mom or your best friend, whether they know it or not, they're emotionally invested in what you're going through and can only give you their perspective on what they think, right? And I understand that what you're going through or going to see a therapist might be just as terrifying as what you're going through. And to that, I say good. If you can book just one session and go one time, you never have to go back, but at least you tried. At least you're being proactive in helping yourself. Your school provides this service. It is part of your tuition. You can go there and sign up. It's free and it's confidential. Once you graduate, it is no longer free, and it could take a very long time to get in with a therapist. So get on it now before it becomes a crisis situation. Stop putting it off until the top blows off, right? Meditation. I teach a meditation group on campus at Penn State Barron, where I'm at. I didn't, I wasn't always a believer in meditation. My therapist always recommended it when I was younger. And I always thought it was just some hippie stuff that was just made you feel good or, you know, placebo effect, right? But the, as I got older and did some more research, there's scientific-based evidence that proves that meditation boosts immune system, focus, creativity, and happiness. To explain what meditation is, I have to explain what it's not. Have you ever been reading a book, and you look at every single word on every single line, and you get to the bottom, and you all of a sudden were thinking about that fight you got in earlier, or what you got to cook for dinner tonight, and you go, what the heck did I just read? Or have I been talking for like the last minute or two, and you have no idea what I just said, Right? You're physically here. Your body's physically here, but your mind is somewhere else. What's the problem with that? One of the biggest, one of the best studies they ever did on happiness was a university put out an app on their on a phone that reached 200,000 people all over the world and asked them questions throughout their entire day on happiness and their in their patterns. What they discovered was the number one issue, the number one cause for unhappiness was mind wandering. Not that unhappiness caused mind wandering, 
but that simply mind wandering, whatever it was, caused unhappiness, not being in the present moment. Meditation is the practice of being in the, in the present moment. You're, it's just like working out every day. You're working out your brain every day, neuroplasticity, training your brain to be here, to read the words on the page, to hear that person when they're talking in front of you instead of your mind being somewhere else in the future or the past. You can get an app on your phone. There's, uh, I'm sure there's yoga and meditation groups on campus, or you can do YouTube videos. Whatever it takes, even just 10 minutes a day can make a significant difference in your life. Eckhart Tolle wrote the book, The Power Now, one of my favorite books. And before he became one of the most renowned meditation experts of all time, he was a professor at Cambridge. He was incredibly successful. He was also incredibly depressed and suicidal. And one night, he was going to kill himself. He looked in the mirror, and he said, I hate myself, like a lot of us have said. And then he thought about that for a second. How can I hate myself? Aren't we talking about two different things here? The I and the myself that I hate? And if there are two, there's only one that can be me. What he realized is that you are not your thoughts. You are the awareness of your thoughts. And when we come to realize this and understand this, we no longer have to take every single thought that comes to our minds seriously. We no longer have to impulsively act on them. But we can watch those thoughts and let them just pass by and just let them and deal with them instead of acting out on them and taking, taking them seriously. Like I said earlier, venting to someone is the, biggest thing you, is the biggest and best thing you can do. It's the most important thing you have to do if you're going through depression or anxiety. I work at the Mill Creek Community Hospital back home, and this is where people go who have tried to uh, hurt themselves or end their lives. And when I talk to these people, every time they tell me the reason it got so bad was because they couldn't tell a single person. It doesn't have to be your coach. It doesn't have to be your therapist. It can be anybody. Because of my profession and what I do, I've had people text me or call me and tell me that haven't told their wife, haven't told their, their boss, anybody. But at least it's someone, okay? Genuine conversation is food for the soul. It is so much more important than we think. We need to know that no feeling will last forever. Happy, sad, angry, whatever mood, no matter how intense it may be, no matter how much it might feel like forever, it will not last forever. It is impossible. And sometimes we need to just wait to ride out the storm and wait for that feeling to pass. Sometimes we need our friends to remind us that, right? My last thing, stay passionate. I believe boredom and comfort are your two biggest enemies when it comes to mental health. I have to stay passionate. I have to be doing something purposeful. I can't just be sitting on my phone or watching Netflix. I have to be working towards something. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing now. I'm doing my speaking. That's why I love to write and read. I recently got into cooking. I bought a sailboat. I don't even know how to sail. I'm just going to try to learn. You go, you got to get outside of your comfort zone, right? Always keep yourself outside of your comfort zone, okay? Dr. Viktor Frankl once said, to live is to suffer. To survive is to find meaning in suffering. If... There is a purpose to life at all. There has to be a purpose to suffering and dying. But no one can tell anyone else what this purpose is. Each must accept the responsibility that their answer prescribes. If they succeed, they will continue to grow. The perfect dream job, winning national championships, wasn't going to fix me. I had to fix me. I had to realize that if I put my health first, the rest would come on its own, not the other way around. And it did. There was a workout we had in college track called the 200 Challenge. It's not over at a certain time or set. The, they set the pace and you keep running 200s at that pace, and then you start with a five-minute break, and that break keeps going down so there's no break at all, and you just quit. I ran that workout 
I ran 19 200s. I was the last athlete left. Felt like a heart attack, stomach flu, and breathing through a straw simultaneously. All while my brain was convinced that a grizzly bear was chasing me, getting ready to eat me. My coach asked me how the hell I ran for so long. I said, I have been here before. I still have those days here and there where no matter how much success I've had, no matter how much I've accomplished, I, f I feel hopeless and I don't want to get out of bed. Where suddenly I feel like that 14-year-old C student kid again. My entire life, I have always felt like an outsider looking in. But eventually, that feeling, it always passes. And I come back to the present moment. And I smile, remembering that I am that outsider. Because that's where I'm supposed to be. That's where people grow. That's where people change the world. That's where I know for a fact that people with mental illness can live a meaningful, successful, extraordinary life. Thank you. Before I take questions, I was going to invite, I'm sorry, what was your name again? Laura up here from the counseling department. Hi, everyone. I'm Laura Gardner. I'm from the University Counseling Center. Um, for those of you who don't know where we're located, we're in the basement of Almer. Um, and there's three of us. There's Dr. Dan Tess, myself, and Emily Powell. And this semester, we're lucky we have two interns as well. So we have more help at this university than we've had in a very, very long time. Um, and one of the things I want to reiterate about mental illness is whatever you're going through, it's very, very, very treatable. Um, I work with lots of different students, and to date, we're almost up to 400 students that we've worked with from the beginning of last summer up, up until now. So there are a lot of students at this university um, that come for services, and we are, our doors are always open, and we're here, and we're willing to help. Um, our schedules are a little bit crazy, um, but I promise you, if you come by, one of us will see you. We'll get you an appointment. We'll figure out a way to make it work with whatever schedule you have. Um, those of you, all, obviously all athletes, um, you guys have crazy schedules. Um, your coaches change schedule, change practice, you have a meeting, you have things. Um, I work with lots of athletes and I will make whatever um, thing we need to make happen in order to fit you in somewhere. So know that there is help here on this campus um, and kind of to reiterate, whomever, just talk to somebody. Um, the people that care about you, your coaches, your teammates and things like that, they'll direct you to where you need to go to get um, professional help. It is a free service. Um, I heard something the other day. Somebody said, well, don't I have to pay? And I'm like, no, this is a free service here provided by the university for all of you. Thank you, guys. I have cards if anybody wants any information. Um, there's my information. That's Dr. Tess's email. Um, so reach out to us. Come by and see us. Um, talk to your coach. They'll direct you our way. Thank you. I forgot to explain this last picture. Has anyone seen the Goonies? Or are you guys too young? You've seen the Goonies? Okay. This is uh, Portland, Oregon. I, my dad took this picture. Um, that's Haystack Rock in the background where they filmed the Goonies. When I was traveling, living out of my car, my dad's a professional photographer. He came out to visit me, and I was still dealing with my depression. And I couldn't even speak to him. I felt so guilty that he wasted all his money coming to see me, and I couldn't, he couldn't even enjoy his time with me. And we were on this hike, and I was 10 feet behind him the entire time. And he turned around and took this picture, and it's one of my favorite pictures he's ever taken. And I hang it in my apartment to, re to remind me um, how far I've come and how far I still have to go working on myself every day. And that sometimes the w thing that you thought was the worst thing that ever happened in your life can turn out to be one of the most beautiful things that ever happened in your life. So thank you guys so much again for having me come out. 
Do I have any questions? I also put up my uh, email address, my website, and my Instagram as well. I will turn off the cameras for, for questions as well, too, if anyone wants to ask a question. You said you suffer from mental illness. What exactly was your diagnosis? Uh, anxiety, anxiety, panic disorder, and clinical depression. I used to be an uh, intensive case manager at Schuylkill County Mental Health. And in Schuylkill County, you talked about the area. It seems that some zip codes have the highest um, level of uh, depression. Schuylkill County is a very depressed county, and there was over 8,000 people in the mental health system, and Schuylkill County uh, did not have enough money in the general fund to treat all of the, all of the mental health uh, recipients, so they had to uh, outsource the MHMR to private agencies, and when that happened, the agencies also did not have enough money in their funds um, to uh, re reach out with services. And so there was a high number of suicides. But the, what I'm trying to uh, get at is, in Pennsylvania, only 13% of adults have a college degree. So finding licensed counselors, counselors in Pennsylvania is a huge, huge uh, problem. So now what they did was they, instead of having a master's degree, they accept anyone with a college degree in any field with their degrees, as long as it's a four-year college degree, they can work as counselors. And there's huge demand right now in Pennsylvania. So if any students uh, want to get a job really fast and you have a bachelor's degree, you can get a job as a counselor in almost every county in Pennsylvania because there's a really big demand for counselors right now. Right, Interesting. Yeah, and I, that's why I emphasize, you know, getting help now while you're in college in, instead of when you're when you go outside of college, because for me, just to get help with uh, and see a psychiatrist took six months. That's from beginning to when I got the medication in my hand. So that's something to really uh, think about. Anyone else? If you don't feel comfortable, oh. We, we talked earlier um, today. Um, I think one of the most difficult things, and you've mentioned before, is um, what to do if someone comes to you. Um, and how, can you talk a little bit more about what your friends did to help you, or what your teammates how they approached you so that the situation didn't become an awkward um, valley between you kind of situation, but something that helped, helped you through that situation. So the, the biggest challenge, especially with teammates, was putting the sport and the team and, the, and that before the human being in front of you. There was a lot of pressure on me, especially being one of the more successful athletes to convince me to stay around, convince me to that that I'll be fine, that that if and I'll be I'll, I'll it'll get worse if I leave, right? And we need to be able to take a breath and realize that you know, no matter how important this championship is or whatever, um, we need to take this person seriously and take what they're going through seriously, and you know, most of us aren't going to the NFL, most of us aren't going to the NBA or the Olympics. Okay, we're here to learn skills and learn life lessons and, and grow from experience from our sport, right? So we need to put the human being first before the championship sometimes. So that was the biggest thing was putting your personal problems aside. And that's why it's so hard. That's why I emphasize so much for people to go see a therapist because they don't have this emotional investment. They don't have, uh, they're not emotionally invested in what you're going through, right? And that's the problem that we sometimes have when we talk to our teammates and our coaches. But I promise you that the people I did tell on my team, um, I've become even closer with them once I told them. And I had a relationship with them that I never thought I would have before because they did put me first. 
and that bond that you have when you carry someone and help them through, you know, it's one thing when you become a brother and a sister and you win a championship together. It's another thing when you're literally saving someone's life and helping them by just letting them. I, I, there was teammates my last semester of college. I slept on their couch maybe almost every single night because I just couldn't be alone. I couldn't trust myself by myself. And they just let me stay on the couch, no questions asked. It's about riding out the storm with them. It's about doing whatever you can for them, being there when you can, right? You don't have to have something profound to say because there isn't anything profound to say. It's just being there for them and compassionate listening, listening with, with your whole body, just like in meditation, like I said. Uh, when I first started doing talks, I'd have people come up to me afterwards, and I had to learn this myself, and they'd start telling me their, their story. And at first I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to say back to this person? I have no idea what I'm going to say back to this person. But while I was thinking that, I stopped paying attention to their story. I wasn't hearing them anymore, right? They're not looking for something profound for you to say back. They just want someone to acknowledge them and, and show that they're being heard and related to and being taken seriously, right? Does that answer your question? Thank you. I'll say, too, a number of the faces in the room are actually familiar. I'm Yvette, Yvette Ingram, one of the athletic trainers on campus, for those of you that don't know me. I will also say that if you are thinking that you need to go talk to Laura or Dan um, or Emily, and you're not quite yet ready to make that step to make it official and go to Almer, please reach out to the athletic trainers that work with your team. As in-season athletes, you have an athletic trainer that works with you during your season. But also remember that we're there when you're not in season. You might not see us as much because we're working with another team. But we are still there and would definitely take the time to meet with you, talk to you, and get you where you need to go. Um, and even I have gone with people to different appointments because they just didn't want to go themselves. So we are here. Use us as a resource, as that intermediate step. And it does make it easier. Promise. Honestly, at, it got easier the more I did it, kind of. At first, I didn't really have a choice. It got to the point where I, I tried to hide it. And when I started skip, being the only kid that never skipped practice, never wanted to miss practice, always loved going to practice, and then all of a sudden, I'm doing the complete opposite, people started coming up to me going, okay, what the heck is up? And I I had to have the courage. And then, But then the, easy, the more I started to do it, the easier it got. The, the more I realized that people do actually understand. I was making up a story in my mind that they were going to be upset with me, they were going to be mad at me, they weren't going to, you know, but none of those things actually happened, okay? Um, but, but, yeah, honestly, in the beginning, it came down to I just, I really didn't have a choice anymore because I couldn't, I couldn't hide it. And that's the worst thing you can absolutely do. And just take my word for it. Please trust me. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of courage to have the strength to tell people what you're going through. Because you don't want it, to, it, it's not a sh sign of weakness or your character has no reflection on any of those things. It's just something that you're going through. Thank you. Anyone else? Don't mean to dominate the questions here. Um, the, and I ask this partially because there's a, a lot of people in the room who are invested in our student athletes' mental health. Um, and we, again, hit on this a little bit at dinner. As you've traveled campuses and, di and different schools, um, what are some things you've seen at other places that are maybe creative or unique that are working um, and, and seeing success working with student athletes? Um, and, you know, maybe what are just some things you feel would be beneficial for campuses to implement, or I know we have the conference commissioner here, or, you know, conference-wide or things that would would help our student athletes who are dealing with mental health issues. Right. Um, so I work at Penn State Barron. I got my job there through um, the Paradigm Journals, through my speaking. Basically, uh, as a we have five therapists and a psychiatrist that comes in uh, twice a week or twice every 
every month and a therapy dog. And they had a need for, they had so many one-on-one -on -one sessions coming in because they did, my boss does a really good job of, of promoting the therapy department. That's another thing is just advertising, advertising, advertising the counseling department. When I was in college, I had no idea the, the counseling department on Slippery Rock existed. I didn't know. And I, they're not, I'm not, like, I'm not um, calling them out. It, this is most colleges don't advertise it as, as much. But at Barron, they, uh, they made a grant, a three-year grant for me to come in. And I give talks and lectures to classrooms, giving this exact talk to classrooms, first-year seminars, um, faculty. I do individual ath athletic uh, athletes and sports teams. And then they let me have a little more creative freedom. So I do meditation workshop on campus, like I said. And we call it a meditation workshop. We learn how to meditate, how to deal with stressors and things like that. For athletes, meditation is a very important thing. I know that Steph Curry practices meditation a lot. Um, and uh, countless other uh, athletes as far as you know, visualizing meditation. And it helps a lot. And then I also do for regular uh, students, they come to the department and I have an athletic background, they get prescribed exercise. So they go, they meet me, I bring them to the gym, they might have anxiety about just getting to the gym, showing up to the gym, and I teach them how to have a routine from Monday through Sunday, how to, how to have that workout regimen, right? And then I'm doing a mental health advocacy club on campus where we raise money for different things, mental health awareness. We have a nutritionist who gives a discounted price to students um, for nutrition advice, but sometimes those students can't even afford that, so our club will raise money to um, to give that, donate that, to pay, to pay for that type of fee. And then for next year, I'm working towards, you know, maybe getting other student athletes involved in helping non-student athletes with, um, how to work out, how to exercise, things like that. The opposite of depression is connection, is purpose, and helping people, giving people a purpose. I, I think I feel so fulfilled, and my mental health has been so much better because I have so much fulfillment in helping others, having this purpose, right? So there's a journalist who started writing. He got really depressed, and he started writing articles and doing research on how different cultures deal with depression. And he went to this tribe in Africa, and they, uh, the village said, okay, we're gonna, put you, we're gonna treat you as if we treated someone that has depression in our village. And the entire village for the, for the day uh, shut down. They all stopped what they were doing. And they all met in the middle of the center of town in a big circle around this journalist, and they started singing and dancing. And then they put them in a, in a, a, a tube or a, you know, a bucket, and they cut this ghost head off and they dump this goat blood on him and this to release the bad juju and the energy and stuff. And this journalist is like, what the heck was that? That was crazy. You guys are out of your minds. What, what are you doing? And these, the tribesmen said, well, the entire tribe stops what they're doing for the day so that you know that everybody cares about you and that we're willing to stop what we're doing because you're more important than anything we're doing right now. And then we do music and dancing to get your blood flowing, to get that to get those endorphins running, right? The ghost blood, I'm not really sure. We're not going to get there. But, that, but, they, but the journalists thought that was crazy, right? And the tribes people said, well, we think you're crazy. All you do is sit in a room with four walls and talk about your problems. And not that I, I'm, I'm a huge advocate for the four-wall therapy. I think it's so important. It saved my life, literally. But there's another side of that coin of, you know, doing the meditation group, the support group of feeling like you have a tribe, feeling like people care about you and relate to you. The exercise, the, you know, getting those endorphins every day are so important. And as athletes, you all know that, right? And then having that purpose, having, feeling like you're helping someone and someone's helping you. It has to be a, a two-way road. So those are ways that um, universities can really set themselves apart and be on the front on both sides, in, within the four walls of therapy and on the outside. And that's what I'm trying to bring to Barron. That's what I'm trying to bring to other campuses as well. Anyone else?
Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, thank you. That was a really good point, too. All right, anyone else? If you don't have a question that you felt comfortable asking in front of everyone, I'm going to be hanging out for a while. So feel free to just come up and talk to me. Thank you, guys.